one of the entailments of this spatialization of knowledge that I've spoken about before, in which we map different types of knowledge uh, across the space, beginning here inside ourselves with our intentionality, or the source of our intentionality, as the most kind of objective version of knowledge, and then extending that knowledge out into space, such that uh, other types of knowledge perhaps are considered more objective and more like objects that some remove. One of the entailments of that is that there are distinct stages within that spatialization at which knowledge becomes differently available to the senses. And here I'm working with the assumption that uh, that the knowing is uh, that knowledge is a, is a is a spatialized which is spatialized metaphor. Then we have to assume that the thing that the, the 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 thing that's doing the knowing is our body, so that different ways of understanding that knowledge, different ways of conceptualizing different types of knowledge in space maps on to the ways that our body relates to space at different levels of remove at different distances. So for example, if I'm standing here looking out over a field, albeit through a fence, then the only sense that I have in operation here for those trees on the horizon there, I'll just put them in view, the only way I can access those is through my visual sense, acknowledging of course that vision uh, is an inactive process, but nevertheless, I certainly can't touch them or taste them or have any sort of olfaction of them. Um, and then making no sound. I can't hear the wind blowing through those leaves. So that must be part of the that, that type of access to those objects, in a sense, defines my relationship to them. So objects at a distance are only available in a certain kind of way. And that certain kind of way has implications. The seeing is something that's not unitary. Anyone can see. In a sense, anyone who has eyes can see. So if someone is standing next to me, it's now pretty much exactly the same sight of those trees that I have. A little bit closer in, in that um, continuum of, of different types of knowing from subjective to objective, a little bit closer in, I would imagine hearing comes into play. I can't hear much at the moment, but I can hear the traffic on the bypass at some distance, even though I can't see the cars but it's the sort of knowing that hearing seems to be indicating is not at such a remove as seeing. It's closer. It's also different in quality. I can hear things that are behind me. And the, the, the things, that the, the objects that I'm hearing, those cars and the birds singing, and I can hear occasional whack of a golf club and a golf ball, those sounds Although they're kind of isolated, they're, they do merge and blend, they're not uh, strictly delineated in the way that visualized objects, for the most part, are. Uh, so the quality of hearing is different. A little bit closer up still, I guess the next one that would come into play would be olfaction. I can't smell a thing at the moment, I've got a bit of a bung of nose, but I probably could detect some smells a bit closer up. Certainly to the extent that I would know whether there was something attractive or um, offensive nearby. And again, I think smelling has something different. Something very personal about unscented smell. I know Brian Eno talked about perfumery in that regard. And how, um, you know, this is sort of a a knowledge which is based on perfumery would be not would not be a positive understanding of knowledge. Close up still, it starts to fall within my grasp. Within 18 inches, I can start to touch things. And tactile knowledge is very different. Again, I've got you know that's that's when I really start to possess things and hold on to things. I can't hold on to things with my eyes or my sense of smell, but I can hold on to things with my 
hands and that's where everything sort of possesses. And, and then closer in than the hands of course. Hello there. Closer in than the hands, it starts, it starts to get inside the body itself. Uh, that's when I start to taste things. And beyond that, of course, it, it becomes purely introspective. Now I'd have to talk about gut feelings and so on. But in terms of the, the, those senses, the, the, the usual five senses, the extra receptive senses, um, if, if spatialization is one of the ways we, we uh, map out different types of knowledge, and it's likely they will fall into uh, particular particular types based on those senses, given that those senses do operate at different distances. And I think we can sort of see that when we talk about uh, when we want to try to imply that the knowledge that we're conveying is objective. We do use visual metaphors. We do say, "I see what you mean." Do you see? You must see this. And of course, we talk about light. I'm just looking back before, so I don't want to talk about it again here. We don't use hearing very much. I think there's a really interesting use of, this, of hearing metaphors. If we, if someone says something to us, and we want to acknowledge that we've that we've been in the presence of that knowledge, but we don't want to confer on it an objective status, we often say, "Yes, I hear what you're saying." I've heard that in so many meetings. I hear what you're saying. What it means is, yes, I can. Yes, there is. You said something, and I acknowledge that you said something, but I don't see it. Therefore, I sort of hearing it. We use olfactory metaphors for types of knowledge. I think which are well, we don't use them very much at all. I guess that's why Brian Eno makes that call for a humor. But to the extent that we do, we just talk about it as a, as a sort of substitute for an external version of intuition. We say something smells fishy about this, or um, something smells funny here. When we don't, um, when we're getting some sort of sense in the outside world, but we're finding trouble conveying it. I've already mentioned what happens with the, the sense of touch. It's very interesting that one, I think. We do talk about it in terms of grasping and possessiveness of knowledge, but I think we also talk about it in terms of feeling. So as I said before, when we, touch, when we put our hand on something, no one else can put their, their hand where our hand is. So we are beginning to adopt a very personal and independent and unilateral relationship to knowledge when we're, saying, when we're using feelings. And we do say, yes, my feelings were hurt, or I was touched, or I can really feel your pain, or something in their face, in the sense that you know, we're, we're trying to indicate that it's something quite close to us, it's not distant. Inside the area of touch, once we're past that, and we start to go into the body with taste, the final and most, perhaps most intimate of the senses, then we're pretty much acknowledging that any information we have at that point is purely subjective, it's inside the subject. And so we said it's just a matter of taste. It's just a matter of taste. It's knowledge, but it's not communal, it's not shared knowledge. It has no status as an object outside of the body. You can't taste things outside the body. So that sense of, uh, of knowledge existing across a, um, an extended space, this object at one end and subject at the other, also seems to map onto the body's relationship to that space and how the different sensory modes operate across those distances. 